Accidents, failures, breakthroughs. Great statement for this year's PopTech. It could be the story of my life and my career path. This is a different kind of slide than other people have shown. But the reason is because, in my case, I was the accident. <laughs> Seriously, I was the accident. Born with a debilitating stutter, I was placed in special education classes from kindergarten until seventh grade, classes that, that the teachers themselves called the dysfunctional classes and that, that all of the students called the retarded classes. Because back then, the New York City school system just didn't know what to do with somebody who had what was termed at that time a frozen mouth. I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak to, to people. So people blocked me off. Not able to have a normal childhood by any sense of the imagination, viewing myself the way adults see me as broken, I turned to the only thing I could turn to at that time in my life, animals. Stutterers can do a couple things right. Well, they can do a lot right, but stutterers can do a couple of things without stuttering. One of them is speak to animals. And that became my life. That became my whole childhood. So when I wasn't at home with my New York City style pets in a dark closet, I was at the Bronx Zoo, where I would ask my father to always take me. And whenever we'd go to the Bronx Zoo, I would especially ask him to take me to the great cat house which is no longer there. In the great cat house, I would stand in front of each of the big cat's cages because this embodied my feelings at the time. As a young child, the great cats, huge, powerful, strong, locked within the four walls of their cage with no voice of their own, no way to tell the human world what they felt, how they were being treated, what they truly wanted. But that was me. That was exactly me. People put thoughts on them which didn't exist, as the human beings were doing to me, as the adults were doing to me. I remember very, very clearly standing in front of those cages repeatedly, whispering all my hopes and dreams, but promising one thing in particular, promising that if I ever got my voice, I would be their voice, and that I would find a place for us. Now, it took me a long time to get my voice. I I'm still a stutterer, and I have to work a lot at it. I work very hard at it, because now we know stuttering is neurological, not fully psychological the way it was thought. But finally, I got my voice at the age of 19 by learning how to control my mouth and how to think about what I'm saying and manipulate the parts of my mouth while I'm saying it as I'm speaking to you. But until I was 19, not having a normal childhood, I locked myself away from the human world the way they were locking me out. And every chance I got, I would go to remote areas just to be by myself, to be away from human beings, and to be with the wild world, and in particular, with animals. I realized pretty early that if I was going to save animals, that I had to have tools within the human world to do so beyond speech, and I wasn't even sure I'd have the speech then. So I went straight through for, for courses in biology and chemistry, and finally I went for advanced degrees in, in ecology, which was a new science at the time, and then finally a PhD in wildlife biology at the University of Tennessee studying black bears in the Great Smoky Mountains. Ironically, life came full circle for me. After I got my PhD, my mentor, George Schaller, renowned in the field, met with me and asked me if I would go and do the world's first study, the first research on jaguars, the Western Hemisphere's largest cat, the world's third largest cat. At the time, occurred in 16 different countries, and it didn't have a single home, a single protected area in any one of those countries. Nothing was known about this animal, so, so I agreed. I stayed two years in the jungles of Belize, capturing, radio coloring, doing the first science on jaguars in the rainforest. And eventually, I couldn't just leave as I was being told to by the group I worked for, which was the New York Zoological Society at the Bronx Zoo at the time. I stayed until I set up a sanctuary for these cats. It wasn't a big one, 
but it was the world's first Jaguar sanctuary and remains to this day the world's only area set aside especially for Jaguars. This put me on my path. I realized I was good at this. I could do this. I loved being in the jungle. I loved being away from human beings. I loved being among people who couldn't speak English so that I didn't have to try to speak to them. <laughs> Eventually, I always thought I wouldn't stutter in a foreign language, but that's not true if you learn a language well enough. <laughs> but that took me on my path. For the next 20 years, I decided this is what I had to do. This could let me fulfill my promise. And I went out full blast to all the world's most wild areas to study cats that at that time we either knew very little about, we didn't know where their distribution was, or we just didn't know if they existed, such as the clouded leopard, the snow leopard, the tiger, and the Asiatic leopard. Two decades I did this, setting up protected areas along the way, not just doing science, that was my interest. It was a means to the end. My end was how can I save these cats? How can I give them a home? And I set up protected areas in places like tropical rainforests all the way to the foothills of the Himalayas. And that's when I realized after 20 years, I was a failure. I was failing. I was failing at what I had promised. Ironically, I was being lauded by the world. I was being given awards. I was, I was raised in my career. I was given salary raises. I was making money and, and being told how wonderful it was what I was doing. And yet I knew I was losing. And the conservation community was failing. Why didn't anybody see it? We were losing all of these animals. No matter how fast I ran, no matter how many hours I stayed up in a day, no matter how many protected areas I set up, I was losing. And at this point in time, I had set up about eight protected areas, over 15,000 square kilometers of pristine habitat for these animals to live, and I could not keep pace with humankind. I couldn't keep pace with the way people were killing and mistreating these big cats and other wildlife, but in particular these big cats. By the turn of the 21st century, not that long ago, and it's worse today, tigers were down to occupying 7% of their range, lions just 25% of their range, jaguars doing the best at about 40% of their range, snow leopards, we don't even know what the hell their range is. This is now. Ironically, my breakthrough, my, my epiphany of sorts, came on the coattails of what I considered my greatest accomplishment. I, I knew I had to get more. I knew I had to try to get larger and larger areas for these cats, because the small areas just weren't working. So finally, it took me five years, it took seven years to do the whole thing. I set up the world's largest tiger preserve. 4,000 square kilometers in northern Myanmar, northern Burma, by the Indian border, a pristine, remote, spectacular area called Hukong Valley. Finally, I thought, if I can't do anything else, and I didn't quite figure out what else I could be doing, because I was still working within the traditional paradigms of wildlife conservation, at least maybe this would be a big enough area. Well, ironically, I was shaken to my senses by the Burmese themselves. When I was asked to meet the, the dictators in Myanmar, in Burma, and the Director General of the Forestry Department for them to thank me about what I had done and about the book I had written about it, their question to me was, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you ask for more? You asked for 4,000 kilometers of a valley, which is 13, 14,000 kilometers large. There are tigers outside that pristine area. Why, you say they're the last tigers left in the eastern Himalayas, maybe the last tigers in Burma. Why didn't you ask us for more? I was blown away. I was shocked. I've never been accused of not asking for much. <laughs> Why didn't I ask for more? I thought, that's so stupid. The answer was intuitively obvious to me at the time, because inside was pristine habitat, outside were people, people. 
the things I didn't like too much. <laughs> and not only were there people out there, but they were people doing the worst kinds of activities for the animals I was trying to protect. Wildlife trade, killing bears and cutting off their paws. Indigenous groups just hunting everything they could see. Opium growing, where they would put shotgun traps around all the opium plantations, gold mining, and then an insurgent army group, fully armed, fighting the government. What do you mean, why didn't I get this? And then it hit me. It hit me while I was talking with them. They got it, and I didn't get it. I was still thinking inside the box of science, of wildlife conservation as it's traditionally taught. They were not. They knew people were part of the picture. The reason conservation is failing is because it's not at the right scale. It never is. And the scale we always fight for are these areas which we think should exist as a Bambi-like equilibrium, a pristine environment where everything stays stable and steady state, and everything that impinges upon it is a crisis. So wildlife conservation is always behind the eight ball, always fighting catch-up, because we're always fighting crises because we're not at the right scale. I got it. I said, OK, I'll go back there. I went back there. I worked another five years with the local people. I worked with the insurgent army, going on patrols with them. And in the end, we got it. 13,000 square kilometers became a tiger reserve. 13,000 square kilometers connected to four other protected areas I had set up in the previous years also, ranging right up to the Himalayas. 23,000 square kilometers, larger than the country of Israel, larger than El Salvador, larger than Belize, and almost the size of Belgium. Finally, the, the, no, don't applaud. It's not the end. Tigers are doing terrible. We have to do, <laughs> I'm still failing here. You have to <laughs> wait. The, this was not enough. This was great, though. It was a country-size area for the tigers. I figured this, now they have a country to roam in. How do we scale, how do, how do I take this to the other cats? And while I was trying to think how I take it to the other cats, my heart's love, my favorite animal, the jaguar, was indeed showing me the way. The jaguar, half a world away, was showing what the scale should be, was showing how to break the mold of all the traditional wildlife conservation thinking. Because at the time, Jaguars were believed to be conserved only within good forest areas, only in protected areas. Outside of the protected areas is the human landscape. Wide open areas, no man's land, genetic dead ends, black holes. So if you're going to save jaguars, you just have to save source populations and maybe do triage. Crap. It's bull. And I, and I grew up with that, and I was one of the proponents of that. And what happened? New genetic tools were developed, allowing us to do DNA fingerprint on jaguar fecal matter. And we started analyzing jaguar feces from Mexico through Argentina, trying to determine how many real subspecies there were among the seven we hypothesized about. You know what we found? It blew everybody away, no, especially me. There were no subspecies, none. The jaguar is the only wide-ranging large carnivore with no racial variation, no subspecies. The jaguar was finding its way through the areas we thought were no man's land. We were creating a box around the jaguar. Our intelligent thinking, our best science, was actually it holding the jaguar back in terms of what we would conserve, because they were finding a way. From Mexico to Argentina, there, there is not a single race of jaguars other than Panthera onsa. One species, one race, from Mexico to Argentina. It's not because a jaguar is making it from Mexico to Argentina. It's because all of these jaguars are finding their way through the human landscape from population to population. This led me to create my biggest endeavor, the Jaguar Corridor Initiative, the Jaguar Corridor, a contiguous genetic corridor from Mexico through Argentina with protected areas. And the corridor areas are not protected areas. They are human landscape areas. We work with governments to zone citrus plantations, cattle ranches, 
anything, anything that is there that the people use. We don't take away from the people. In fact, we guarantee local communities their rights to be able to do what they want to be doing. As long as a Jaguar can move through that area, which they have been doing. This is the largest working model of carnivore conservation in the world right now. We have sign-on from all the governments of Central America, right from the heads of state. And we just got sign-on from the government of Colombia recently when I met with the, with the former vice president and now the new president. And we're working our way down through South America, but in theory, all the countries accept this Jaguar corridor. There will be a contiguous corridor from Mexico through, through Argentina. That is the best guarantee not only against extinction, but it is the best guarantee against stochastic or man-made environmental perturbations, such as global warming. Well, this was what we had to do everywhere. Clearly, we had to do it everywhere. What the thinking, the new paradigm in conservation has to be in order to scale up, in order to properly work at the landscape we should be working, is that everything is part of a conservation strategy, a conservation paradigm. From the best, most pristine kinds of habitat to the most degraded. It doesn't mean this is acceptable, it means that this becomes part of the conservation landscape that you deal with. Instead of this being a crisis you're always fighting, this becomes part of the dynamic disequilibrium that conservation really is, just like the real world. And what you do is you, you accept perturbations around a steady state that minimally allows viable populations of these big cats to breed and to travel and to survive well into the future. Now, I couldn't do this alone, and I was very frustrated. Fortunately, in 2006, I was given the opportunity to leave the Bronx Zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and to start, co-found an organization called Panthera, focusing only on the world's species of wild cats. I was able to hire all, not all, some of the world's best field biologists, felid biologists, and they started working on this range-wide corridor strategy right now on snow leopards, on lions. Meanwhile, I turn back to tigers. Tigers are doing terrible. We are losing tigers. We could essentially lose most of the populations of tigers in our lifetime, which is horrendous. Tigers are in a really special state. Tigers once roamed a contiguous, a nearly contiguous range throughout most of Asia. This is what their accepted habitat is right now, but that isn't where tigers exist. Those red dots are where tigers live. The only way tigers will really live is if we bring the corridor models to these less than two dozen, two or three dozen tiger source sites and establish tiger corridors throughout much of their existing range. Russia is not up on here. The way we did with jaguars, this is doable. This is harder than the jaguar corridor. But we're doing it right now. It's much more difficult politically, socially, economically, but this is a doable thing. We can save these big cats. We are working towards saving them. The little boy who didn't have a voice who couldn't find his voice, found it, not that long ago, really, but found it. And more importantly, he became the man who found a passion and realized what he had to do in this world in order to feel himself both a complete human being and to fulfill the promise he made so long ago to those cats. But those cats will live. They will live for you, and they will live for our children and beyond. After that, it's in their hands. But I guarantee you, we're going to keep them alive until then. Thank you very much.